Hi, EFS listeners. My name is Nicholas Sitch. I'm a 23-year-old writer and radio student based in Nam or Melbourne. I'm passionate about Australian stories and perspectives, and my work seeks to inhabit what makes us simultaneously ordinary and unique and boring and profound. I immensely enjoy producing this short audio fiction, uh, which is a love letter to place. Most of the sonic landscape in this piece is either directly pulled from or inspired by the spot where I grew up, a piece of Bunurong country, and I hope as a listener you get a real sense of that spatiality. Otherwise, this is really just a story of intimacy and release. Enjoy. Max sees the forecast and gives up dialysis. Says she won't spend a week above 40 with a machine doing the living for her. I squat at her feet and pinch mincemeat between thumb and forefinger. Magpie sidestep gingerly across the lawn and even now at 7pm, the backyard is dense with the promise of tomorrow's heat. <coughs> Maxive smoke through her back teeth and blinks at the dunes. Busted capillaries clutter her wrists and I'm reminded of fireworks at the carols. The fault lines of her face intersect brutally. They're gridded and gift a lovely logic to the whole affair, emphasising a sort of symmetry that would have made her a handsome prospect as a youth. The breeze shifts and the bass note of her cigarette sits in my throat. It's weird how awkward a sudden sense of mortality can make things. We're closer than neighbours. Over the years, Max has assumed a sort of maternal role in my life and any other day we could talk underwater. But now the decision's made, we're clicking tongues, inspecting hands. A pulse builds across the bridge of my nose. And then the growling tenor of her voice, harping on about the light, the way it refracts off the golf course. God's nectar, she reckons. The monologue culminates, as they tend to do, with Max angling for a beer. And I tell her no, because she's dying. She suggests we give Jack the deciding vote. Jack, of course, is the old school copper diving helmet strung like a punching bag above the terrace. Max says it was her uncle's from the west, who bore into the kind of dig that makes you forget yourself, resurfacing with fat pearls to decorate the decolletages of England. Dad reckons he actually helped Max pick it up from the tip. Says she used to wheel it out on match days. Losing supporters had to don the thing and lap the block in the nud. I try to conjure that kind of vitality. A shock of pale asses and a cannon of yelps folding into the June evening. But the image is slippery, and set as it is in my current view of a fading thing. In the relief of the hallway, I trace the knuckled limestone wall, pausing at the warm parts where, for more than a century, hands have gripped to leverage weights swung through doorways. An elliptical ages in the sunroom, diet manuals are stacked on bowed floors, and lately, everywhere, the kind of yellowed plastic that collects in the homes of dying people. Toilet aids and shower chairs, handrails. Max's partner, Fran, doesn't sense my presence. She's a recent development, decades Max's junior, spends most of her day grimacing at an online solitaire game, typing with a single index finger and overextending the mouse. Sometimes I try to explain that she doesn't need to cover as much of the desk to get where she wants to be virtually. Then she'll pull the thing out at the plug and slam on the kettle. The only other time she gets up is to drain Max's wee bag. In the density of the cottage, the oversized fridge looks ominously futuristic, like a cryogenic freezer. In a perfect world, I think we'd stick Max in there. Dethaw her on my wedding day or on an afternoon when the light's oily and everyone's drinking beers. I relish the crack of the suction tearing, the sound heard for the last time, realising that I know this place like a body. Outside, Max interrogates a jock itch in the shifting light. I drop a VB into her hollow lap and begin threading the images together with the cadence she finds calming. Buttery winter sun, a thumb tracing the fold of a hanky and a crop of skin cancers across a hairline. We've done this routine often since her body started revolting, picking moments. Max reckons if we inhabit every second, consciously, then the momentum stops. I'm not sure that time's that elastic, you can't just distend it by sheer will, but she's convinced and I play along. <coughs> the shadows slope and the day slackens and Max and I pace around the orchard looking for a spot to sink her ashes. Finally, she settles on some real estate under the avocado tree. Something about cross-pollination and needing a female variety. We blink at the spots, watch dappled light play on the dirt, 
kaleidoscopic. The brackets around her mouth deepen when she smiles. Elsewhere, the drone of surf, dark bears down and the warmth doesn't break. The following day, Dad's off work and we head next door. Max is perched under the awning. When she rearranges herself, I notice the bottle tree calves, scarlet and soft where fluid is collected overnight. I'd like to bore into them, feed the hydrangeas, then Dad wouldn't have to say that European varieties are a luxury we can't afford. Max detects my repulsion, develops a vulnerable tightness around her eyes and suggests a drive. We crawl through the back blocks of an anonymous development, saplings brace against stakes and plastic blisters on just fitted windows. Eventually, the tendril-like streets open up onto the main drag and the pier transpires in front of us. Fish and chip shops exhale the stink of old oil, and we sit in the car park watching silhouettes thrust themselves off the jetty, arranging, extending their bodies mid-dive with the unselfconscious elegance of prepubescent boys. Max sucks on a sprite. There's a new vacancy to her now, and I know she's weighing up how little she's impressed upon the world. Like maybe the heat will shift and the tide will spill back into the bay and things will just grow over the place where she conducted her life. The sentiment it collects in my throat, because that horizon's flat enough to make anyone feel hopeless, I lean forward and plant the images in her middle ear. The heft of an arm across me as I sleep, shadow puppetry of bats, and the spilling blue skin folds of a geriatric swim group. Maxi coughs through a smile and a cloud of halitosis shifts across the front seat. <clears throat> In bed, I listen to the subtly pick up and siphon through the dive helmet so that it's shrieking. I imagine it's Max, bare ass, grazing against the dark, rounding the block in a final gesture of light, like a muscle contracting in rigor mortis. She sees out the week and dies with the cool change. An ambulance pulls into the turning circle and peels away 15 minutes later. That night I'm taking out the bins and see Fran, still at the computer, her face distorted by the weird half-light. The morning of Max's send-off, Dad's outside and squinting at the middle distance the way Dad sometimes do. Grapefruits are split and rotting on the lawn, pulpy, spilling like roadkill. Every so often their smell is collected by the wind and it registers like the bottom of a bin. It's one of those latent summer days when the sky feels somehow higher and the world assumes the quality of a cathedral and you find yourself moving reverently through it. Between pillars of native hibiscus I clip towards the pier. The water's clearer than air and for a while I grip the ladder and bob with the tide, ignoring a bunch of kids struggling to tread water beside me. Then I bore down. Pressure builds in my sinuses and my vision's collapsing and I think maybe I'm starting to forget myself. I roll onto my back, head cocked in ablation to the light. There's the underwater tinnitus of boats resisting their moorings and I speak at the model depths, watching the water interpret words into bubbles. Thin ankles in a front garden. A tradie resisting a smile. The way the dunes and the ocean reciprocate light. <laughs>